well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you've joined us on the program today. Coming up in just a couple of minutes, we're going to be talking with Ryan Petty, whose daughter Elena was murdered at uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018. Ryan, you know, has been a a frequent guest here on this program. Uh, He is a Second Amendment supporter, uh, as well as somebody who believes that we can actually stop these types of attacks without putting more gun control laws in place, without restricting the rights of law-abiding Americans. And Ryan has, he's not just talking the talk. I mean, he is walking the walk as well. He has been working with the Secret Service uh, to identify potential threats. He's been talking with law enforcement officers around the country about his own experience and the experience in Parkland, Florida, the missed warning signs, the failures of law enforcement to act when those warning signs actually did appear. And his point of view is getting buttressed uh, by a new report just released by the Secret Service called Averting Targeted School Violence, a U.S. Secret Service analysis of plots against schools. The agency's National Threat Assessment Center analyzed nearly 70 school plots between 2008, excuse me, 2016 and 2018 that were disrupted, that were prevented. And the key to preventing these attacks, according to this report, is pretty simple. It is early intervention by somebody who is close to a student who is planning violence. In other words, don't ignore these warning signs. Is that really all that it takes to prevent these types of attacks? We talked with Ryan Petty. Take a look and a listen. Ryan, thank you so much, sir, for coming on the program. It's so good talking with you today. Great to be here, Cam. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this new report from the Secret Service and the uh, National Threat Assessment Center, this is really, I mean, it's interesting, and I would encourage folks to read this, but this is critically important as we're talking about you know, ways to improve public safety in this country. You've got uh, folks out there who say, look, the, the, the answer is more laws on the books, right? We've got to restrict uh, the rights of law-abiding Americans. We need new gun control laws. We need to ban these guns over here. We need to uh, pass this gun control law over here. And the Secret Service report that investigated specifically school shootings between 2006 and 2008 says, listen, the most effective way to prevent these attacks is by using your eyes, using your ears, and actually listening sounds like listening to your gut when 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 you are aware of something that is wrong it's up to us as individuals to to let somebody know to speak up and speak out about these behaviors yeah you know cam we all have that spidey sense right that something's not right uh, something's out of context or something doesn't fit within the context that that we normally see in day-to-day life it could be somebody acting suspiciously at a shopping mall, right? Um, at the grocery store. It could be um, a student at a school that's, um, you know, normally getting great grades and then all of a sudden, you know, starts failing lots of exams and, uh, and having trouble, uh, you know, associating or relating with other students. Um, those things should elicit some um, cause for uh, reflection. I, I don't want to use the word concern because it, it, it that's sort of a different level, but but um, it should cause us to say, hey, uh, what's going on with this student, as an example, or that guy? Why is he wearing a long, heavy coat? You know, when it's summertime, those kinds of things are uh, are warning signs that we could uh, we we should be aware of and, and pay attention to, and uh, and I'm sure we'll get to this communicate to somebody that can uh, can do something about it. Yeah, that's absolutely key. Um, because if you don't communicate, then uh, again, chances are um, nothing is going to happen. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the National Threat Assessment Center, they looked at 70, almost 70 disrupted school plots that had been reported and averted between 2006 and 2018. And again, it sounds like there were some commonalities. I mean, you mentioned... Uh, you know, a, a, a change in behavior 
uh, among a student. You know, if they're getting good grades and all of a sudden they plummet, they talk about um, bullying. They talk about fixations on uh, other uh, uh, incidents like the uh, the shooting at Columbine. And it's not it sounds to me, Ryan, as if it's not like, you know, look, if, if all of a sudden your kid uh, starts dressing like a goth, you don't necessarily need to call the FBI. That's not what we're talking about here. Right. But we're talking about taken as a whole. When you see these concerning behaviors, you don't need to go to DEFCON 1, but you should reach out to the school, perhaps reach out to law enforcement if you are concerned enough uh, about their their actions uh, and their attitudes and things that they might be doing and saying online uh, or in in real life, as well as, as you say, some of these, you know, maybe smaller incidents that get your spidey senses tingling. Well, I... I I'm really excited that Secret Service did this report because um, I've been talking with them and working with them for the past three years. Um, and and so far, their research had all have been about attacks that were, six, quote unquote, successful. I hate to use that term, um, but had been uh, taken out. This this is actually a report about averted incidents, right? And what can we learn from from those? And it was something I had been asking the Secret Service to look at. Uh, was pleased to find out a few months ago that they were looking at this and that they would come out with this report. Um, yes, there are some commonalities. There are some things to look for. There are concerning behaviors. This does not create a profile. Uh, it doesn't mean because your son <laughs> starts dressing goth that uh, that that uh, he, he's planning a school attack or your neighbor or friend down the street or whatever. But what what we learn here from these averted attacks. It's very similar to what we learned from those that were carried out. Many of these uh, attackers made plans, and they did so months, sometimes years in advance. So that was a surprising thing. One of the attackers had, I think, was planning something for three years in, in the future. So there's planning behavior. So, so the warning signs, you know, the student that's struggling in school, um, that that's one where, where, you know, Talk with the teachers as a parent, uh, sit down with your child, have a conversation with them, meet with their teachers, meet with their schools, see what you can do. Uh, talk to friends, um, bring, there's, you know, a circle of, uh, of support around that student. When we get a little further down the road, we get into this planning phase and we start to see these behaviors where, where, um, you know, they're, uh, in some of these attacks, we saw pictures where they were drawing, um, the, the, the weapons that they were going to use, or they were very graphically detailing the uh, schoolmates that, uh, that they might want to attack. Um, that becomes it, yeah, then concerning. And that's probably the point at which uh, you need to get law enforcement involved and you need to, you need to uh, alert um, authorities that can do something about that. Some other really cool stats in here that, that I hope we have time to get to, but one of them was just uh, 94% of these attackers talked about their attacks to other people. 94%. That means we can stop these things. That means somebody else knew about the attack before it happened. And if that person communi- would communicate with law enforcement, the attack could be stopped. And I think that was really the point of doing this, this report and this research. These things can be prevented. Doesn't require any new gun control laws. Doesn't require any restrictions on personal freedom. This is simple. The laws that are on the books today are sufficient. We have to open our eyes and we have to communicate. You know, and right, I mean, it sounds to me like when you, when you throw out that stat, 94% of of these attempted uh, assailants actually talked about their plans beforehand. You know, it's, it's not, to me, it's not just that that gun control doesn't work to stop these attacks, but it leads us down uh, a blind road. It takes us in the wrong direction because all of a sudden we start talking about the inanimate object. We try to ban our way to safety or arrest our way to safety uh, as opposed to what we should be doing, which is again, Looking at those individuals uh, who pose a risk and then acting when we receive that information that tells us, OK, th- this is this is not just, uh, you know, uh, some 
This is not just my gut steering me in the wrong direction. This is something that I legitimately should be concerned about. If we if we keep advancing this idea that we can legislate uh, our way to an end of these types of attacks, we're going to continually run up against failure after failure after failure when it sounds like what we should be doing is trying to educate and and train all of us on how to increase our own situational awareness and how to identify those those risks when we see them. Well, 100 percent. I mean, look, criminals don't obey the law. That's why they're criminals. So the idea that we can create new laws, that somehow somebody that's intent on bringing a weapon to school and killing other students is somehow going to obey a lesser law <laughs> is, is crazy. We have gun free. Most schools are gun free zones today, right? That doesn't, that's never prevented a school attack. And the idea that, that somehow additional background checks or, or additional firearms laws are going to prevent these school attacks is crazy. Number one, number one, number two, the mode of attack will change. And what we saw in this report was a number of attacks that were planned uh, with weapons other than firearms. And there were pipe bombs involved and other, you know, other attack vectors. So the idea that we can focus on, uh, a, a, you know, firearms or a certain type of firearms and ban our way to safety, it just simply won't help. Criminals don't obey the law, number one. Number two, the attack vectors will just change. They'll, they'll come up with another way to carry out their, their plans. The real way to stop these is to be aware of what's going on and communicate. And what my message has been to schools, because this, this report was really about attacks that were averted on our nation's public schools. Mm -hmm. uh, really, what we have to do is train school personnel to recognize the warning signs and then be involved in what is called behavioral threat assessment. You've heard me talk about it before. It's actually the methodology that the Secret Service uses to protect the president and the president's family. It's every bit, in the words of the director of the Secret Service, it's every bit as important as what they do with their, uh, you know, with their weapons and other tactics that they have to protect the president. Behavioral threat assessment is their most prized tool for averting uh, violence against uh, our elected officials. And it, wor and it works in our schools and in our public spaces also. All right. Um, I've got a couple of follow-up questions based on, uh, on what you just said here. Let, let's start with behavioral threat assessments, because I think that there are some folks out there who say, look, this is like minority report stuff. This is weird. This sounds like the Department of Pre-Crime. Um, what, what do you say to those folks? Do they have the wrong idea about what behavioral threat assessment really is? Uh, I think they do. Uh, and, and look, I'm, um, I'm a pro-freedom. I'd like the government to be as little involvement, have as little involvement in my life as possible, right? Um, but what, what we know is that we gather together in public places, right? Um, and public, and our public schools are a place where our sons and daughters gather, right? To learn. And so what I, what I, what I learned, unfortunately, through the loss of my daughter, Elena, in part, in the Parkland tragedy is that there were other students that were attending that school and former student, a former student in particular that attended that school that had, the intent to harm and kill students and staff at that school. And so what, what do we do about that? Well, we don't need minority report. We don't need pre-crime. What we need to do is open our eyes and be aware of the warning signs. The earlier we do that, the more possibilities we have to help that, in this case, student or former student get the help they need. Many times that's mental health uh, counseling. Um, it could be help um, um de-escalating whatever uh, triggering uh, events are going on in that person's life. We all face challenges in life. We all have struggles. There are resources out there to help folks. That's really the goal of behavioral threat assessment. It's not about introducing someone to the criminal justice system. That only happens once we get to a point where plans are being made, 
weapons are being acquired to go carry out an attack, then at that point, you've now violated a law. Uh, we just we just learned that you violated the law through this behavioral threat assessment process. So I understand the concerns. Um, what I will also say is that even at the point where law enforcement gets involved, that's when all of the due process protections that everyone is afforded uh, kick into place. We're all innocent until proven guilty, and there's nothing different about the way behavioral threat assessment works in that regard. Gotcha. Okay. What about the idea of using these techniques and these tactics to prevent active assailant attacks outside of a public school setting? I, I know that this report focuses specifically, as you said, on uh, thwarted attacks in, in our schools, but it, it seems to me like, again, these these lessons can be applied outside of the schoolhouse, too. One hundred percent. And so, you know, it's too early to talk a lot about Atlanta, what happened in Atlanta and Boulder recently. But we have heard media reports and I think there's been some law enforcement com confirmation that at least the attack in Boulder, the attacker had uh, there were others that were aware, I think specifically his family was aware of uh, his his intentions or at least his uh, desire to hurt, you know, and attack people. So these same principles that can work in our school, behavioral threat assessment as a model, like I said, it's what the Secret Service uses to protect the president. That's certainly a public official visiting lots of public spaces. And we and we know it can work in other public contexts and other public spaces. So for example, in the state of Florida, our governor, Governor Ron DeSantis, has issued an executive order. All law enforcement in Florida is trained to, to use behavioral threat assessment as a new way of policing. It's actually taking policing and moving it into uh, the 21st century, if you will, and really changing their the, the methodology here in Florida. So our law enforcement officers in the state of Florida are, are trained. They understand how to receive these communications from members of the public. They understand how to process them. And then they understand how to have a conversation with the, the, um, uh, the person that was reported, whether or not that person needs to be arrested and put through the criminal justice, justice process is one of the decisions that law enforcement makes. But that's no different than decisions they make day in and day out when, when, um, you know, when dealing with criminal activity. So we're doing it in Florida. I think as a state, we are far safer uh, than we were before Governor uh, DeSantis acted on this. And and I've been involved in the training um, that our, our state law enforcement officials are putting on around the state. In fact, uh, in a week or so, I'll be speaking again at the next training session uh, for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, it's a it's an effective tool. It's something that works well, and it gives uh, law enforcement the ability to do something to prevent tragedies like we saw in Parkland. Um, and I think uh, I think it's really the future. I hope other states adopt it. I, I got to say, I mean, I uh, I think this is really powerful stuff. Um, and unfortunately, I got to tell you, one of my biggest concerns, Ryan, is that. I'm glad that you mentioned Governor DeSantis, because honestly, one of my biggest concerns is that a lot of politicians, particularly those who are promoting uh, more gun control laws, will 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 not give this idea a look because it doesn't allow a role for too many politicians to play. Politicians love to grandstand and say, look what I did. I did something. And this doesn't involve, as you say, it doesn't it doesn't involve a new law. It doesn't you don't have to pass a bill to do this. You, you can you can put these measures in place, uh, you know, fairly simply. And it, it, are, are you concerned like I am that they're going to be, you know, politicians who who keep going down that that dead end road of gun control because it offers them the opportunity to issue a press release or to preen in front of the cameras, whereas, you know, things like this really don't. Yeah, the the you know my frustration for the past three years um, has been the focus on gun control as the solution or the end all for all of these tragedies. Um, we can't ban our way to safety. I've never believed that the issues are far more complex than simply uh, 
making a certain type of firearm illegal or increasing, you know, background checks, none of those things will be effective. None of those will stop what's going on. The issues are far too complex. Politicians love to run on the, the gun control issue because it's a fundraising mechanism for them. They can say they did something and there are powerful, well-funded gun control groups that take advantage of every tragedy. They did it at Parkland and they started day one in Boulder, Colorado, as an example, raising money and raising the issues, uh, the gun control issue. It's, it's a fundraising vehicle for a lot of politicians and it's easy for them to sign on and say, Hey, look, I did something. I, I, I got behind a gun control bill completely, whether or not it's effective. I think for most of them, they don't even care. It's just, they can say they did something and they can raise money. So um, we can continue to go down that path and continue to have these debates and fights. And we'll continue to have tragedies like we saw in Parkland, like we saw at Sandy Hook, like we saw in Boulder, Colorado recently, and like we saw in Atlanta. If we continue to have only the gun control conversation and debate, we can look forward to a, a spate of new tragedies. If we learn the lessons that the Secret Service is trying to teach us here with this adverted school report and the other reports they've done and apply the methodologies that they use to protect the president, we can stop these things. Ryan Petty, as always, my friend, thank you so much for coming on the program today. I, I appreciate your time uh, and everything that you had to say. Thanks for having me, Cam. Really do appreciate Ryan joining us on the program. We will uh, have a link at Marion Arms uh, on this uh, Secret Service report so you can read it for yourself. But again, I, I think this is really, really valuable information. Uh, and when we talk about, look, obviously, I, I've got my concerns about the constitutionality of how we address violent crime. I, I don't want to see any of our civil liberties eroded uh, with the false promise of increased safety and security. But it really sounds like the focus here is not on new laws, right? It's not on new restrictions. But again, it's on all of us being aware of our surroundings and the folks that we're interacting with. I, I think the key takeaway, that key statistic that Ryan mentioned, 94% of these attackers talked about their attack beforehand. That means in at least 94% of cases, there was the opportunity for intervention. And that is a far greater chance to intervene than by enacting a gun ban or a magazine ban or a waiting period or universal background checks or even a red flag law. Uh, this is, it seems to me, like a, a very fruitful uh, and thoughtful way to actually improve the the public safety both inside our schools and out by focusing on trying to deter the actual threats in the individuals that pose an actual threat as opposed to trying to cast a wide net over all of us restricting everyone's rights in the hope that we will also ensnare those with the intention to do harm all right, let's turn our attention to our armed citizen story today, our good deed of the day, our recidivist report. We'll start there with a case out of the Bay Area where a suspect arrested in the killing of Richmond, California rapper Tay Way. The uh, district attorney alleges that an Instagram post actually led to that murder. Tay Way uh, posted uh, online uh, a, uh, a picture of him, which sort of uh, allowed the murder suspect in this case to identify where he was. Uh, and Deontay Reed allegedly then uh, drove over a few blocks to where uh, Lamonta Tayway Butcher was back in September, opened fire, and shot and killed uh, Lamonta Tayway Butcher. Reed has now been charged with conspiracy to commit murder and attempted murder in another shooting that occurred six days earlier, a, a non fatal shooting in Richmond six days before Butcher was killed. And according to the Times Herald, an alleged accomplice in that case, the guy who actually pulled the trigger, 
well known to law enforcement. This was back on September 12th. Prosecutors say that uh, Reed participated in another shooting on McDonald Avenue in Richmond, uh, California. The charging records allege that after seeing a rival gang member, Reed, who was behind the wheel of a car, made a U-turn in a Renton Ford Explorer, and his passenger fired 10 shots at the victim, striking him twice. The passenger has been identified by police as 17-year-old Carl Townsend, who was also named as the suspect in the murder of a 17-year-old earlier this month. Now, according to the Times-Herald, Townsend allegedly shot and killed the boy in Richmond one day after he was released from custody in Oakland, California, on an escape warrant. At the time of his release, Townsend had pending arrest warrants in connection with a series of armed robberies in Stockton, California, but Alameda County released him without conducting a warrant check, according to multiple law enforcement sources. So he gets released from custody in Oakland. They don't do a warrant check before they let him go. He has active warrants out for violent crimes in Stockton, California. But because they don't check, they don't know. So they put him back out on the streets. And a day later, he allegedly shoots and kills a 17-year-old. Now, again, in this case, you've got a number of offenders who are believed to be responsible for a large number of violent crimes. Right? And yet... The California criminal justice system doesn't seem to be paying any attention to these guys. We know, we know that a disproportionate amount of violent crime is committed by a very, very small number of offenders. Less than 1% of of a city's given population can be responsible for 30, 40, even 50% of its violent crimes. Now, again, in California, lawmakers say, well, what we need are more gun control laws that apply to everybody. No, we don't. We need targeted deterrence programs. Programs that try to take these individuals and turn them away from a life of crime, but also programs that target these individuals with prosecution in the federal courts whenever possible, that do not give out sweetheart plea deals to repeat violent offenders. And we also need to be doing the basics, like, I don't know, checking to see if there are outstanding warrants before you let a violent criminal suspect return to the streets. Something, again, that apparently was not done in Alameda County, California. Today's armed citizen story of the day from Indianapolis, Indiana, where a police report over the weekend, a man uh, was shot in the neck during a domestic situation on the northeast side. When uh, we don't have a lot of information uh, about this, that when police showed up at this apartment complex uh, on the northeast side of Indianapolis over the weekend, uh, they did find a man that had been shot in the neck after talking to witnesses as well as the woman who pulled the trigger. Police believe that the man was uh, getting aggressive uh, towards this woman, uh, and they believe that this was a case of self defense. So hopefully, we'll have more information. We just know the bare bones details here. Uh, But I'm glad that she is okay. The uh, guy who was shot is expected to recover and uh, probably going to be facing some charges going forward as well. Uh, Finally today, our good deed of the day. Take a look at this picture. You are looking at Sergeant First Class Matt Mobley there in uniform. He's the uh, non-commissioned officer in charge of range maintenance at the Combat Training Company at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And it was uh, January 23rd, he saw something in a gas station parking lot that he says uh, caught his eye. He said, I saw a car that had smoke coming out from underneath. It was dark. I could see the smoke in my headlights. And when he looked again, the front end of the vehicle had actually burst into flames. He said, I parked far away because the flames were at the gas station next to the big fuel tanks. I got up to the car. It was already engulfed in flames. He said, "Uh, I heard something. And it was an individual inside the car trying to kick the windows out. Jason Wells, who's an off-duty firefighter, he was actually asleep across the street from the gas station. He woke up to the sound of a revving engine. He went outside to help as well. He said, I I heard the guy screaming from inside. A man could not break those windows. He could not get out of that vehicle. Uh, Sergeant Mobley said there was no way to pull the door lock up, couldn't get out, which is absolutely terrifying. He's laying on his back trying to kick the windows out, but he just did not have enough room to lay down in there. It was a small car. So Sergeant Mobley and Wells successfully broke a window pulled the man from the burning vehicle. Sergeant Mobley said he was smoking from the fire. His hair was singed. His whole car was in flames. 
Once they uh, got the man extricated from the vehicle, Sergeant Mobley then turned his attention to putting out the fire. He said, I ran over to the other side of the gas tanks uh, where there was a fire extinguisher station. I grabbed a fire extinguisher to try to put the car out. Said it was too far gone. Uh, Crocker, Missouri, Fire Chief Mark Francher said in his mind, Sergeant Mobley is a hero. Said if he had not stopped to help break the window and help firefighter Wells drag the person from the burning car, we most likely would have had a fatality that morning. And on uh, March the 5th, uh, Sergeant Mobley was presented with a flag that was flown over the state capitol building in Jefferson City, Missouri, as well as a signed resolution of appreciation uh, adopted by the Missouri House of Representatives back on March the 3rd. So in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Sergeant First Class Matt Mobley. Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. We thank you, sir, for your very good deed. That is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for joining us as well. Tomorrow, we've got more Second Amendment news and information for you. In fact, we've got more Second Amendment news and information for you throughout the day at bearingarms.com. All you have to do is visit the website there to keep track of everything that's going on when it comes to your right to keep and bear arms. 